Good day, friends and church family. Thank you for joining together as we meet together, two churches cooperating for the kingdom of Christ, Mount Zion Church in Bennett and Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church in Seagrove, North Carolina, two congregations cooperating for the kingdom of Christ. We're joining today in home worship due to the crisis of the COVID-19 virus. We're trying to do our part to stop the spread of this terrible virus. In our worship today, we'll be singing, uh, singing two psalms. First is a praise song, I love you, Lord. And then we're also going to be singing the hymn, This is My Father's World. And this words will be on the screen for you. We'll have prayer together. And the two scripture lections, words will also be on the screen, Exodus chapter 17 and Romans chapter 5. And then we'll have a message on uh, the creation, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Let's worship together. of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And so Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also, take in your hand your rod, with which you struck the river, and go, 
Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And our New Testament reading is from Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into his grace, by which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribu tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his sons, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For our message today, we're continuing with a series on well-known Bible texts, the ones that we all know and love and sometimes misunderstand. This morning's message is, In the Beginning, God, from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The same way that a novel writer never attempts to prove that he exists, the Bible does not attempt to prove the existence of God. The first four words of Genesis tell the story about what the Bible writer assumes in the beginning, God. And with that, the Bible assumes what addle-brained atheists and so-called intellectual evolutionists have been wrong about for centuries, God is. Pythagoras was a philosopher who lived 2,500 years ago, and he said, man is the measure of all things of things which are that they are so, and of things which are not that they are not. That's like saying that genius in an automatic transmission is the intricate gears, or that the beauty of the Mona Lisa is in paint and canvas. A car's transmission would never have existed except for the excellence of a human engineer putting it together. And the Mona Lisa's beauty could never have shown from the canvas except it first existed in the mind and the heart of a master artist. And in just that same way, the center of every original thought and deed of all time and eternity is the one we call God. As Psalm 14.1 says, it's only the fool who said in his heart, there's no God. Man may be the crown of creation, but he's still the object of creation and not its God. For that, you need a creator. We do our best to prove to the unbeliever that God exists, but it's largely unnecessary to try to convince anyone. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says that the reality of God is apparent to all people, even as they behold the things of nature. Knowledge of God is inherent in created beings. We know he's real. And any nonsense about him being dead or asleep or never was, that's just nonsense. Well, this morning, I would like simply to start where the Bible does with the fact that God is. And like the writer of Hebrews reminds us, it's impossible to please God without faith. Anybody who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So in the act of diligently seeking God this morning, please note, if you will, three statements about God 
Statements of Reality. Statement number one, reality statement, is that God is spirit. John 4, 24 says, For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. In speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus revealed the great truth that our God is not impressed with outward displays of righteousness. He exists in a realm that provides him with access to the inner being of any man or any woman. Jesus also saw the deep spiritual need of the woman he was talking to, and he knows our needs as well. It's possible to please God only when the inner person, that inner place of humanity, the soul, some call it, the will, uh, the spirit of a person that's within each of us, only when that is in harmony with the heart of spiritual God can we actually please God. Jesus told us in his earthly ministry that the only way to come to the Father was through him. And so that tells us that it's only possible to worship God by accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. God is spirit. A second statement of reality is that God is personal. The personality of God is seen in the personal way that God has dealt with mankind. From a bush that burned and was not consumed, God said to Moses, I am. He is the personal pronoun. Reality and cognizant existence are personal qualities. God has all of that. God weeps. That's a personal quality. He loves, he hates, he cares, he creates, he feels loss or grief. All of these are personal characteristics or attributes or activities. There's a concept of God called pantheism. Pan meaning everywhere, theo meaning God, so God everywhere. It says that God is in everything. He's in trees, he's in the grass, he's in the oceans, he's in porcupines. Literally, he's in everything as a component part, just like we have cells in our bodies. Now, this theory of pantheism, this doctrine or religion of pantheism, this robs God of personality, making him substance or part of the creation. God is personal, and he takes a personal interest in his creation but he's not part of the creation. He's the creator. There are those who may still subscribe to the hands-off type of God. This was popular in the 1950s and 60s. The picture is God as a creator who made the world like a craftsman might make a grandfather clock. And he wound it up and he lets it run by itself. There's no interference. God never interferes in man's affairs. Man can take care of himself. And so we are alone on this planet Earth. There was an episode of a popular TV show called The X-Files where two agents are talking. Uh, one is Fox Mulder and the other is Dana Scully. And they're discussing a, a prison chaplain who claims that God speaks directly to them. And when Mulder expresses skepticism that such a thing could ever happen, Scully asks, Mulder, don't you think that God can talk with people? And Mulder replies this way. He says, God is just a spectator. He only reads the box scores. But that's not the way it was when the children of Israel cried out to God from bondage in Egypt. God didn't sit back and let them stew in it. God rocked the kingdom of Pharaoh until Pharaoh let them go. God didn't apply hands off when his people were being chased by Pharaoh's army because Pharaoh had a change of heart and wanted them all back. Here were God's people boxed in. They had mountains on two sides. They had Pharaoh's army hot behind them and the great Red Sea in front of them. God's personal breath blew every last drop of water out of the way and his personal family walked over on dry land. Now, how different is the biblical view of God than the impersonal view that some people try to push? Psalm 145, 18 says, the Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. There are billions of humans on this planet and God is a personal God who loves us consciously and personally. The world was lost in sin and degradation and the personal God who loved each and every one of us came to rescue us. So far, two statements. God is spirit and God is personal.
A third statement of reality about God is that he's holy. The word itself, holy, means other or different. In Isaiah's vision, the prophet saw angels, the seraphim, gathered around holy God. Isaiah chapter 6. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting lofty on a high throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. We sing that hymn, don't we? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. God is different than we are. He's holy. There are several characteristics that describe the holiness of God. Uh, four of them in particular in his holiness, God is eternal. He's always been, Revelation chapter 22, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God is eternal because he was there to create the beginning and he'll be there at the last to call an end to time. Nothing existed except by the creative hand of God. When it says in Genesis that God created, the word created in the first chapter of Genesis is only used in the rest of the Bible when referring to God's activity. The word in Hebrew is bara, and it means to create something out of nothing. Words used in reference to the creativity of man carries the inference of recreating, taking what has already been created and reforming it. God is eternal in his holiness. And secondly, in God's holiness, he is omniscient. Omniscient knows everything. Proverbs 15, 3, the Lord is watching everywhere, keeping his eye on both the evil and the good. Omniscience. I used to think when I was young that the word was pronounced momniscience because my mom had eyes all over. She always knew what I was doing, and especially if I shouldn't be doing it. Well, God is a different kind of holy. He not only knows what is going on all over, but he knows why. He knows the intents, the motives of our hearts. That has implications of judgment. If God knows everything, that means that one day there will be a day of fearful reckoning for those who have treated his holiness lightly. In his holiness, God is eternal, he is omniscient, and also number three, he is omnipresent, meaning that he is everywhere that he needs to be all the time. Jeremiah chapter 23, can anyone hide from me in a secret place? Am I not everywhere in all the heavens and the earth, says the Lord? Knowing that God is everywhere can be a bad thing or it can be a good thing. It depends on your relationship with him. A person who has a daily fellowship with God and loves God and surrenders daily to do God's will, that person has a desire to constantly be in his presence, and that is a good thing. On the other hand, those who would rather God leave them alone and stay out of their business, they have God's permission to do that. It's called free will. But someday that permission, permission is going to end and Jesus predicted that in that day of judgment, men and women who have avoided the presence of God in their life will call and beg for the mountains to fall in on them to drive out the presence of a holy and righteous God of judgment. But there is a positive side to the omnipresence of God. It's to be found in the comforting of God's Holy Spirit. Jesus said that we would be his body here on earth and that we would do the things that he did and even greater. And he also said that he would never leave us, those who love him and are uh, in his service. When you consider the omnipresence of God, you find that his presence sometimes takes the form of human compassion and ministry initiated by heavenly means. Jesus did say, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And so his compassion becomes human beings' compassion for those who are in need. In his holiness, God is eternal, he is omniscient, he is omnipresent, and lastly, God is omnipotent, all-powerful. Anything that power can do, God can do. 
There was a Sunday school teacher who was questioning her pupils after a lesson on omnipotence, that, that all-powerful God. She said, now, children, is there anything God can't do? And immediately, the pastor's son raised his hand. The teacher felt certain that the young man had misunderstood, so she asked the six-year-old, okay, well, what is it that you think God can't do? And the boy said, I heard daddy say just yesterday that even God can't make everybody happy in this church. Omnipresence and omnipotence. He's everywhere and he's all powerful. Omniscience, all knowing. Omnipotence means there's no power that originates anywhere but from the throne of heaven. Perhaps in the age of nuclear power and space shuttles and the power that's at our fingertips all the time, we may miss the opportunity and the enormity to recognize the power of God. So I'd like to give us, as I close this morning, just a small glimpse into just how powerful our God is. And it comes from nature. Uh, our star is the sun. It's 93 million miles away from where you're sitting right now. If you travel at the speed of light, which is a million miles every five seconds. Turn on the light, one, two, three, four, five. It's gone a million miles, that light. It takes eight minutes to get to our sun from where we are right now by the speed of light. If we launched a rocket at that speed of light, aimed at the next nearest star past our sun, it wouldn't arrive at that star, which is named Proxima Centauri until Thanksgiving, three years from now. That's the closest star to this planet, to our star. Scientists tell us that there are 8,000 stars that we can see with the naked eye. If you use a great telescope like the Hale Telescope at Mount Palomar uh, in California, that can reach 175,000 light years into space. Now, if your mind is starting to hurt from all these numbers, we're only halfway done here. Our galaxy, known as the Milky Way, has somewhere between 100 and 200 billion stars. If you stretch them out at three to five light years in between each other and multiply that by 175,000 light years, that's just our neighborhood of stars, the Milky Way. If you get out beyond the Milky Way, the nearest galaxy outside of our neighborhood, the Milky Way, is the Megalanic Cloud. That's about 130,000 light years away, just to get to the beginning of that galaxy. And it covers a distance of about 300,000 light years, <laughs> traveling at the speed of light. These are two of the closest neighborhoods for us. Now, are you ready for this? Radio telescopes indicate there are over 800 million galaxies that we know of. The total amount of stars that computers have been able to estimate is one quintillion. Now, if you're not a math major, you got a picture of this. That's a one with 18 zeros following. It's no wonder that the psalmist asked the question, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Compared to the entire galaxy, compared to the entire number of galaxies, compared to the entire universe of creation, we are so incredibly minute compared to this vast universe. Isaiah chapter 40, though, in verse 12, tells us that God has all of that universe, not just in his mind, but he holds it in his hand. In the span, it says, Isaiah 40 and verse 12. So here's the question for us. How big is your God? I believe in a God as big as the Bible has described for us. I believe that he's spirit. I believe that he's personal and that he's holy. And our God is the eternal, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I also believe that God is love. And a God who is that big and powerful and loving is able to do some things in me and for me. He's able to comfort me when loved ones die. He's able to meet my need if the mortgage comes before I have the money. 
He's able to handle the worry I feel when governments threaten to blow us off the face of the earth with a bomb or the COVID-19 virus strikes and threatens life and limb. He's able to handle it when 13-year-old children get pregnant. He's able to answer the empty-headed skeptics who doubt his existence. And he's able to save a sinner like me and like you. And he's able to do so much more. Here's the bottom line for us today. If God is able to create a universe as wonderful as that in which we live and hold it all in the palm of his loving hand, he is well able to keep us, all of us, until the day of judgment and forever if we simply give our hearts to him. Let's join in prayer together. Father, you are the certain and central reality of the universe. Your power and your grace are without measure. In a world of turmoil and uncertainty, our God is a rock and a redeemer. Lord, grant us a glimpse of you, as you did with your servant Moses when you had him hide in the cleft of the rock. Allow us to sense your glory and power as you pass even in this place, in these holy moments. Lord, we are a needy people. We ask for faith to strengthen our belief in you and our trust in your providential care. We ask so that we may be people of faith, strong faith in a world that's lost faith. Do this, we pray, O Lord, that we might be strong instruments of peace and grace in your almighty, all-knowing, ever-present, holy, powerful hands. For thy kingdom's sake, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let it be so in each of our lives, our great God. Thank you for joining us in worship on this beautiful Sunday. Go in peace and go in grace. Amen.